This webinar series is brought to you by Group Coaches International in cooperation with Blackwater. Smell good, feel good. This coaching webinar series would like to give special thanks to the following. Samahang Basketball and Filipinas Coaches Commission Head, Coach Dong Yochiko. Basketball Coaches of the Philippines President, Coach Louis Gonzalez. Got Skills Head, Coach Alan Ricardo. And Frontliner, Christopher Tom Uyano. Again, good evening, uh, dear coaches, and thank you again for uh, joining us uh, this evening for another uh, webinar. Uh, this time, uh, we'll have our special guest from Talking Text. Uh, but before introducing uh, Coach uh, Mark Dickel, uh, I'd like to uh, say uh, good evening also to our resident sports psychologist, Dr. Teddy Villasor. Good evening, Doc. Good evening, Coach Riel. Coach Mark. Rick. Hello, good evening. And uh, of course, our uh, broadcaster, Rick Olivares. Uh, good evening. And uh, Rick, I'll give you the order of introducing our special guest coach. Well, to all our participants, Coach Ariel, Dr. Eddie, we've got a really special guest. It's not every day we get to have a guest who made the semifinals of the World Cup, the FIBA World Cup, where the New Zealand team finished fourth. But he's also an Olympian. That's not even the coolest thing. This man played for someone who Filipino basketball fans are probably familiar with, Coach Bill Bayo. This man played for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, running Rebels. He was a point guard who averaged double figures. His playing career spanned almost two decades before, coach, before embarking on a coaching career that saw him start off with Albania, and now he's here with the Philippines. Also with Ateneo. The man I'm talking about is none other than Coach Mark Nickel. Welcome. Good evening, Coach. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction, man. It's good to be here. Coach Again, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us, Coach. And just, you know, I know uh, Rick um, uh, uh, introduced where you played and how you start, Coach. But from your, uh, from your journey, well, what, what has it been like? How was your journey as a coach from a player to a coach? Well, well look, look, I think for me, it started really, really early. Um, obviously, my father was a coach, so I kind of grew up around the game. Um, I, was, I was really little as a kid. I wasn't big, you know, so at around the age of 14 or 15, I grew a lot. And that's suddenly when I became capable, you know, as a player, it kind of happened to me at once. So, you know, up until then, I was kind of the guy that was watching the other people play. And I was always around tournaments and being that my father was a coach. You know, I was kind of already thinking more like a coach, um, you know, and then fast forward a couple of years, suddenly I, I've gone from that, you know, I'm like the last player on my high school team to suddenly when I'm 16 years old, I'm starting on our pro team in my city. So it happened for me really, really quick. Um, you know, two years after that, I'm playing for Baino UNLV and suddenly I've gone from playing in front of two or 3,000 to in front of 25,000. So you know, like uh, the basketball thing for me, it, it, it just it just sped up from there. Um, you know, really, really lucky for me that I had Bill Baino as my coach in college. He was, he was really patient and good with me. Um, he's still someone that I talk to most weeks about, man, pretty much everything. Um, you know, and then from there I went to UNLV and then I had 12 years in Europe um, playing as an import over there. And, you know, that, that really felt like two or three years that that, that went so quick. Uh, and then I'm 34 years old now. Now, then I decide to, man, I, I really want to do this coaching thing. I, I don't want to keep playing until I can't play anymore. So, you know, that's kind of when I transitioned into being a coach. And, and, and I kind of figured if, if I really want to be a good coach, it's not, a, it's not good enough just to have been a good player. You've got, to, uh, you've got to learn how to be a coach. So I kind of went back to New Zealand. I took a role actually coaching kids. That was my first job. Um, you know, that was coaching kids from under 13, under 15, under 17, under 19. I kind of did that for a couple of years. And I was still playing professionally in New Zealand at the time. So it was kind of a way for me to, A, make a good income and B, learn how to be a coach. Um, I would recommend that to anyone if you really want to learn how to coach. Try and coach 11 and 12-year-olds <laughs> how to do stuff. That's much more difficult than, than dealing with adults now, like what I'm dealing with talking picks at this level. It's just motivating them and putting them in the right level. When they're young kids, you've really got to teach them how to play. 
So, you know, from there, I uh, started coaching the pro team in my city. Uh, that was really enjoyable. Uh, last year in New Zealand, I was assistant coach on the national team also. Um, I got an opportunity over here with Talk and Text, uh, actually through Bill Baino and secondarily through Tab endorsing me. Um, and yeah, just took the opportunity and, and felt like it was too good an opportunity to turn down, come over and, and kind of be taken out of my comfort zone a little bit. It was, it was just so easy in, the, uh, in New Zealand. There was no, no not there's not pressure, because if you don't win in this job, you're out. But there was no pressure for me from the standpoint of everybody over there knows me and I, I, I'd already established myself. So, you know, like uh, f for me, it was the challenge coming over here and really knowing nothing about it. I'm, I'd only been here one time previously, assistant coach on the national team, watching games. Um, so I didn't know a whole lot about Philippine basketball other than that they were incredibly passionate. And they got huge crowds to the game and everybody knew the game from what I could tell sitting on the bench. You know, you learn a lot about play countries you go to from the comments you get from the crowd. And, and, and when people are educated on the game and over here immediately, I could tell they knew what was going on. So, you know, my, my country is not so much like that. It, it's more rugby and cricket and sports like that, that the average person is super educated on. So, so that was always interesting for me. Um, you know, that was kind of the background I had in coaching. Uh, you know, the, the, the coaches that I had the opportunity to learn for and play for, I feel like I've taken a little bit from them and tried to put it together and make my own kind of recipe of what, what, what I would like the game to look like. But at this point, man, I'm just a work in progress. I just look at it like that. Like there's so many things, A, I want to get better at, and B, I think I have to learn in order to, to, to get to the point that I want to get to. Coach Ariel, I have a question for Coach Mark. I hope you don't mind. Uh, oh, sure. Back off in a few minutes for a while, Coach Mark. What, what, what system were you running at UNLV? Because when you got to play for Coach Tab, it was a triangle, and you talked about that recipe of yours. What have you brought together from both into what system you preach today? Well, in in, in college we ran a lot of sets. It was more, you know, you run a play for a guy to get a shot. Um, you know, and that play wasn't often for me. It was more for the, the more talented guys I had on my teams, right? Um, but, but Billy was really good because, you know, first off, the shot clock was longer then. It was 35 seconds as opposed to now it's 24. So you had a lot of end of clock situations of which he'd give me the ball back and allow me to play off the screen and roll in. So I kind of looked at every play like it was for me at the end of the clock. It was just at the start of the clock I had to find a way to make sure that we got the other guys the ball. Um, you know, if you fast forward that to, to Tab, Tab was my coach when I was 11 years old. Um, uh, and he's coach, he coached me all the way through to when he left the national team when I was 29. So I've been on and off with Tab for the longest. And from, from the very first time that I worked out with Tab, he was all about trying to teach people how to play. I mean, that's why I have such a huge respect for him because... Yeah, he's a disciplinarian, and yeah, he, he wants things done his way. But, man, he's really trying to teach you how to play. So, you know, for the coaches out there, when you see Ateneo play, it's not a byproduct of all the practice that they're doing, all the teams practice. It's a byproduct of him actually teaching all those kids how to play. And, you know, that's why he has such success on all of his teams. And the first time he saw me play, he actually thought I was left-handed and told me that I should play off more with my right hand. It, it was because my father had told me I wasn't allowed to do any moves anymore with my right hand. So Tad always thinks like that. He's always trying to make people out there work on what they see as their weaknesses. And, and he figures if you do that, then over time, you're going to end up being a really, really good player and your team will do well. Coach? Coach Ariel? Teddy? Man, I, I, I'm happy to keep going. You, you, you want me to go on the, some of the similarities, some of the differences I see from here and through around the world? Sure, go ahead. All right, so, so, so just observations. Obviously, I've been here almost two years now, and we should have played six conferences, but I've only got a chance to play three, right? So I, I, I've, I've had a lot of opportunity to look. You know, I've gone to every PBA game that we didn't play in that I could. I've watched every game on TV. I watch all the UAAP games. Um, obviously, I try and help that to know it being the tabs 
involved with Athenao and give him my thoughts. And he does much the same at, at Talk and Text. So I, I feel like I've got a relatively good idea uh, at, at the high level over here of how the game is played. Um, you know, the, the, the things that I think make Filipinos unique don't necessarily transfer over onto the court. Um, you know, like speed, agility, quickness, shooting, passion, uh, toughness, not being scared. Um, all of these are great traits to have. These are traits that around the world, uh, if you focus on the right things in the game, man, they're going to make you incredibly tough to beat. You look at a lot of college teams, they're all undersized. You know, there's no player who's over 6'5 or 6'6. Six, six. In Europe, the same. They play a lot of teams that are undersized. But they can beat teams with size because they play to their strengths. You know, from what I see, a lot of teams over here don't, don't necessarily do that. They're, they're, they're trying to play a style that is not conducive to that. Like, the NBA to me is by far the best basketball in the world because all the best players play there. That's why they play that style. That's the reason they play like that. Because the simpler you make it, the easier it is for great players to play. Um, whereas around the world, there's got to be some more continuity to the game. There's got to be some more misdirection or um, depth layers to your system in, in order to make it difficult for the, uh, for the defense to be able to guard you or vice versa. Um, and, you know, like if you equate it to the UAAP, man, there's four or five teams that are as talented as that now. Um, you know, and yet Ateneo seems to find a way to make it really difficult for every other team, A, to run their stuff, and B, they get better shots than the other teams get. So um, that's what I've noticed in the UAAP. I've really noticed that, that there's so many good teams, and they're all well coached. It's just maybe they're not playing directly to what their skill set or their talent is on their teams. Whereas, you know, Ateneo does that. Um, you know, when, when I first came to... Uh, talk and text. I can remember Billy telling me, he was like, uh, you're, you're taking a job there that no one else wants. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on that job. Um, you know, like if you have bad results in that job, you're not going to be there for too long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that, that to me, let me know right away that there's an expectation in this job at Talk and Text to win, that people here are expecting results. And to me, that's how it should be. Right, and then I looked at the roster we had and the players we had, and and we had talented players all over the court. So, you know, it just didn't really add up that our team was struggling like that. Um, and then I looked at the other teams in the PBA, and I was like, okay, Juma, I knew Juma from the national team. I know he's a problem. There's no other bigs over here other than Slaughter. Uh, okay, when I came here, it was right at the end of a six-five conference. So all of the PBA teams got six-five and four players in that played as big men. Okay, that, that, that kind of makes sense because there's a lack of size here. Um, all right, how do the other teams play? Mm, a lot of the other teams are trying to play like how San Miguel play. Well, that's not going to work because there's only one Juma. Um, so that was my, kind of my learning process to go through it. Like how can I take the team that I have now, Talk and Picks, and make them unique and not necessarily worry about how we beat San Miguel because we were losing to everybody before that too. It was more, how do we make it so that every team in the PBA struggles to match up with us, right? So, you know, that's the process that I went through straight away was that, okay, we've got a lot of talented players. How do they fit? Do they fit? Do they want to play together? Is there any chemistry together? Uh, all the other PBA teams are really talented also. They've got a lot of really good players on their team. Um, San Miguel seemed to have the deepest roster as in the most capable, say, one through seven. Everyone else is pretty close, though. You know, the talent spread around the, the teams is pretty good. So why is San Miguel winning all the time? It's not just Juma. What are they doing well? You know, uh, what did Hinebra do well in certain conferences? How are they able to play really well when Brownlee's there? Okay. What do they do differently when he's not there? That, that was my process that I went through as soon as I came because each conference is so different. You know, hopefully we're about to play an all Filipino conference, which to me is the realest conference because that's without anyone covering anybody's holes on the team. Right. So, you know, that, that, that's an exciting process, you know, obviously not having Juma or San Miguel makes it more wide open. However, 
and they got Mo in there now too. So that's not like that's a big drop off. So I still see them as one of the top teams, if not the top team. So, you know, the, the, the league is very even. The parity is very even. In the eliminations, anybody can lose to anybody. Um, in the playoffs, you know, all the teams are tough. They're all well coached. Everybody's scout. Um, there's no easy games. Man, it's, it's just a really good competition. Um, really, really excited, you know, as soon as I came here to be in, a, be in a country that plays basketball all year round. Always an interesting prospect because usually you have seven, eight months on, four, five months off. So, you know, that, that, that was really interesting to me because, you know, how do you handle that injuries, you know, wear and tear, how much do you practice? You know, just a lot of learning went into that the whole first three or four months. Yes, coach. Uh, there's a question from Emirito. Um, after a year staying, how's your perception? Are is Philippine basketball improving or getting worse? Oh, the Philippine basketball is improving a whole lot. Just since I've been here, it's improved a lot. Um, I, I've noticed how teams are playing differently and trying to attack certain stuff. Just that we do differently, you know. Um, you know, like we 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 tracked Jumar in a fashion that had some success, and now a lot of teams are doing that. Um, yeah, look, 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 man, it, it, it's really improving. It, it, if you look at, if you look at how Filipino basketball is seen around the world, and how it should be seen, and how it will be seen in the future, it's just not compatible with how it actually is. Uh, there's so many talented players here that can play. You know, transfer it to New Zealand. Our national team is better right now, but we have ten or fifteen players that could play at that level. In the PBA and in the Philippines, there's probably 40 or 50 players that could play at that level. So, of course, Philippine basketball is going to improve. Of course it is. You know, that's why I was so excited to, to see that they gave Tad the opportunity to run the program because, I mean, that's what he did for us. I mean, we went from 103rd in the world to fourth. And that was in three years. And a huge part of that was, yeah, the players – that were coming through, we all came through together and we were kind of in our prime. But he was our coach from under 20s, under 18s, through to the national team. So he was a big part of the reason we got that continuity. So in seeing in seeing the way that the program that Tad has set out, that you know, Boss Al, Boss Ricky, Boss MVP have, have put forward with Ryan Gregorio, I'm sure that if they can stick to that program, uh, by 2023, there's going to be a really competitive national team. Because, look, Tad's done it before. He knows what it takes. Um, you know, who ends up being the national team head coach for that is not as important as making sure that all the players are, are all prepared and ready and experienced and, and know how to play a multitude of different styles because that's what international basketball is. So, you know, when the PBA has 11 or 12 teams all playing a different style, is when our national team will be exponentially better. What, what was your idea of Philippine basketball before you came over here? One second, just turn the light on, man. It's getting dark, right? Okay. I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, what, what, what was your idea of Philippine basketball before you came over? As a player before, what well, was I your idea of Philippine I'm basketball? Sorry. Yeah, I knew Jason Castro, obviously. I knew Terrence Romeo. Uh, I knew June Mark. I knew Troy. Like, they uh, just through scout stuff. Uh, my opinion mm -hmm. of it, it just seemed like, like against us, for example, in New Zealand, we want to play a disciplined style, okay? Mm -hmm. We want to try and make it so that it's very, very difficult for the other teams to match up with what we do. And on defense, don't make any errors, right? So there has to be adjustments made to how we were trying to play. Now, now for the talent that you guys have on your team is far greater than the talent outside of our top two or three players we have on the New Zealand national team. And way better. One through ten, your guys', your guys team is much better. So how do you speed that game up? How do you make the game quicker? How do you make it take the ball out of our better players' hands and put it in the other guy's hands? They were the questions that we were asking before the game and preparing for what was going to happen when we played your national team. So 
my opinion was kind of that. Like, wow, man, there's so many talented players on their team. We'd love a couple of their players. They're not even playing to be on our New Zealand national team. So we, I knew there was crazy talent here. That wasn't the issue. It's just how do you play a style that allows all those players to produce and play really well? You know, that was the questions I had when I came here. And, and then seeing a PBA game, I was like, wow, there's a lot of really good players underneath those players too. So there's no reason the national team here is not really good and with a whole lot of depth. Okay, uh, Dr. Eddie, there are some more questions from Clarence. Um, Coach, we have a question from Clarence. Um, sure. What makes Coach Tab a great and a unique coach? What is his philosophy? What are the qualities that you would want to follow from Coach Tab? Well, just to adapt, right? Like, you know, like, like, like look, man, Tab's good. He's smart, and 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 he he doesn't beat himself. Uh, he's prepared. His teams are ready. Gets on great with the guys. But man, he adapts. He completely changes from one thing to the next. Uh, he ran the triangle for a long period of time and had success. Uh, and then with our national team, he he ran a motion offense and then let me play off screen or off. Um, now you look at him now, he, he doesn't run any of those though. He runs motion, he runs different sets, he, he makes another offense up. I think it's just his adaptability and the fact that he listens to his players and he listens to all his coaches, right? So a lot of the coaches I played for, man, they didn't want to hear what I had to say at all. Um, I think that's what made Baino unique too, was just the communication factor and he wanted that communication. Uh, another coach that I really respected was Brian Gorgian. I, I played for him in Australia my two, first two years out of college when I was 21 and 22. And he was much the same, man. Like, they want to have a lot of communication with their players and find out what's going on. And if you've got a feel for what's going on in the game, man, they're more than happy for you to tell them what you think will work, right? So, man, he just adapts. You know, he'll be sitting at home right now like, all right, maybe we should play zone. How can I learn that, right? Like, you know, like, like his real strength is his adaptability. Coach, when, when, you, came, when you came to the Philippines, um, you were essentially the new member of your team. How did, how, did you, um, how did you get to know all your players and, and implement your system? Well, it, it wasn't very hard for me because I was used to that. In my basketball life, I've always been the new guy. You know, playing as an import of Europe, man, you're cut waved on another team. You go and you just go right to the next thing. Um, you know, I, I think my biggest my biggest strength is communication, right? Like the basketball stuff for me is a work on. That's stuff I'm still trying to learn and get better at. But, but I feel like that's my real strength. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to find a way to get through to everybody exactly, A, what their concerns are, B, why you think we're being losing, and see what do you think we need to do in order to fix this. Then go home, write up a plan, come back, and try and get everybody to buy in and find a way to do it. Um, you know, look, coming to Talking Text, it wasn't easy. There was factions on the team. There were some guys that didn't really want to play with other guys on the team, at least from what I was seeing. So it's trying to find a way to get some truth to that. Uh, all the guys are great guys. The guys that were gone from the team were good guys. I got on great with all of them, but... You know, my job as a coach is to try and get a group of guys that are going to buy in and pull in the same direction. In order to do that, you've got to find out what the truth is and then try and make the sense out of whatever truth they're telling you. So, you know, that, that was kind of the hand I was dealt when I came here, but it was something that wasn't, it's not new for me at all. Like uh, everywhere I went, whenever I was a player, I tried to approach it the same way. So as a coach, I've just tried to take that thing and, 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 and do the same. Thanks, coach. We have a question from Ian. Ian's asking, what is the highlight of your coaching career so far? Thank you. Well, look, I, I, I think the highlight has been, you know, for me, I, I took great enjoyment uh, in my previous job in helping young kids go from 11, 12, 13 year olds to the national team, uh, to college in America. I've had one guy that's, made, that's got a great chance to go on and make the NBA. Um, you know, I get real enjoyment out of seeing players improve and play and play better. Um, you know, I'm still, in my mind, just transitioning from playing, to be honest with you. I love playing so much that, you know, I just want to pass my love of the game on to other people and try and help them improve at their game. Um, you know, I'm looking at being in this coaching thing for the next 30 or 40 years. So, 
So I'm trying to keep that that mindset of a player for as long as I can, because as soon as it's gone, that I don't want to work out anymore. I don't want to do anything. So, you know, I've got huge enjoyment out of just working with the players every day, uh, trying to help them get better at their skills, uh, help them with goals, and then try and help them reach their goals. Uh, you know, in New Zealand, that was my whole passion. I mean, the, the national team paid for six months of the year, the other six months of the year. My focus was on every kid who was under the age of 18 that was in the national team program. So, so it was in order to try and help them reach their goals. And in New Zealand, a big part of that is not professionals going to college in America, or with what we did, what I did with two kids over there was send them immediately to Europe and play. So, there's different pathways now. Um, the world is going to become a really small place as far as basketball goes. Coach, you have a question from Ronald. Ronald's at, Ronald asks, what adjustment does the Philippines need to do to catch up with the international level of competition? Thank you. Well, I, th I think they're doing it. I, I think, you know, like I hear a lot of other coaches say all around the world, not just here, uh, the national team needs more time in order to prepare and get ready for national tournaments. Well, none of the other teams have any more time. Matter of fact, the Philippines probably has more time than others. Uh, if you're looking at New Zealand, we get two or three days before any uh, any window, and maybe two or three weeks before any national team uh, international event. So, you know, it's not preparation. That's not what it is as a team. What it is is getting a whole bunch of players from the Philippines that are all able to play all around the world. Um, and hey, that can be as a dealer's team that travels. That can be like what we're put together now with the with, with the new dealers pool. Um, but these players have to go all around the world and learn different styles and be coached by all kinds of different coaches and get exposed to a whole lot of different ideas and thoughts and, and get put in environments where they're playing as the import and they've got pressure and if they don't perform, they cut. Um, you know, the, the, there's only one way in this game to, to end up being the absolute best you can possibly be and that's to be put under pressure every day and put under pressure as much as you can. If you're comfortable, you're just not going to improve. And, and being at the PBA is the biggest deal over here, and it really is close to the NBA in the, in the average Filipino's mind. Those kids have made it. That's been their goal their whole life to make it. Um, you know, around the world, it's just not like that. Like, if you're from Spain, your goal is not to make the ACB. Your goal is to play in EuroLeague and make the NBA. So... You know, the aspirations are so much higher. If you're talking Turkey, it's not to play in the TBL, it's to play in the NBA or play in EuroLeague. So, yeah, like, I think it's it, it's aiming higher. It's having something higher for the kids over here to aspire to. Um, it's to have a pathway for them to do that, either through Asia or, or, or through the national team program or through college system elsewhere. Um, it's just to get exposure to different styles of basketball. Because otherwise whatever the PBA or the UWEP is played like, they're the players we produce. Uh, look at the New Zealand national team right now. Our top seven players don't play in Australia or New Zealand. They're playing all around the world. So, of course, when they come back and they play, they're going to add so much more to, to our program right now. And, and, and I, I think that's the way of the future. You've got to have players from all around the world that are all bringing different experiences back so that when your national team gets together, they just take, keep taking you levels up. Coach um, Kaipato recently announced that uh, he'll be joining the NBA G League. He's the first uh, international prospect to join. Uh, Ian's asking, um, what are your thoughts on Kaisato's decision? Thank you. Well, look, I think he's improved a lot in the last year. You know, just from the, oh, I watch all this stuff on Kai. First off, great kid, awesome family, urban, what? Awesome. Uh, got to spend a little bit of time with him just because. I live right across the road from Ateneo and I'd see a lot of his practices. Look, I, I think he's a super talent. Um, you know, it's just hard to know what the right way to go is. Um, you're seven foot two and your best attribute is you're a great passer. Uh, that can work, you know, especially if you can shoot the ball of which he's shown the ability to be able to shoot the ball. But the game's changing all the time. So, you know, like he's going to have to be able to stretch the ball out to the three-point line and he's going to have to be able to guard screen and rolls really well in order for him to make the NBA or to be an NBA prospect. I think he can do that. But that's the hardest thing for big guys to learn is how to guard screen and rolls. And 
if you're him, the offensive end is going to be far, far easier than the defensive end. Now, if you if you equate it to the NBA right now, his matchups are who? Who's his matchup? He's got a guard for Zingas, right? So you start looking at NBA players, you know, how do you guard them? I'm sure on offense in three or four years from now, Kai's going to be a good enough player to be able to give every team anywhere in the world problems. But man, you've got to be able to play at the other end too. So look, if he can work on his agility, if he can work on his strength a little bit, if he can work on his quickness, if he can really work on guarding screen and rolls, because in the NBA, that's all it is. Screen and roll, screen and roll, screen and rolls. So how are you going to get really, really good at doing that? If he can, man, there's a role for him in the NBA. Thanks, Coach. Coach Ria? Yes, Coach. Uh, there's a there's couple more questions. Um, what, uh, what do you think? What, what, syst what system does... Uh, does now that you you've been here for almost two years, what or three years, what system was that does a Filipino should focus on in order to, to be uh, successful in the world stage? See, I, I don't think it's a system. I, I think it's just skill sets, right? Like shooting is a huge prerequisite, but dribbling as little as possible and getting good shots it distorts the defense more and makes it so much harder to go. So. How can you dribble the ball less but get off more good shots, right? So being better off the catch, being better moving without the ball, uh, being a better screener, being a better passer, uh, being a better cutter, uh, all things that right now, if you look at the, the, the best Filipino players, they're best when the ball is in their hands. Let's take Jason Castro. He is incredibly difficult to guard, A, off the dribble, or B, off the screen and roll. And that's his strength because over here, that's how everybody plays, right? Well, we've been working, I've been working with Jason a whole lot and off the ball. What do you do when you don't have the ball? Where do you stand? Uh, how do you play off screens? Use screens, set your player up, occupy your player. Uh, I think it's more those things. You know, they're, they're all things that Tab worked on us with from the time we were 11, 12, and 13 years old. So by the time that you come to the national team now, if I have the ball in my hands or I don't, I still know where to go and what to do. Uh, I can still be effective, no matter what your skill set. Shoot, non-shooter, be a better screener, cut more, whatever. But you've got to know how to play without the ball in your hands. So I don't care the system. All systems work. All the stuff the PVA teams run work. All the stuff the UAAP people run work. However, what are the players on the team doing when they don't have the ball? You know, what is the spacing on the court look like? Where do you stand when you don't have the ball? If you don't have the ball, how do you occupy your player? Uh, I think it's skill sets. It's not what they run. It's not a system. It's completely how you teach the players how to play an international style of play. Okay. Thank you, Coach. Um, from uh, Ar Arwin Villamor Adina, if you've been given the head coaching job for Gilas and not on an interim basis, uh, you think, you honestly believe that uh, we can beat the Aussie team and other contenders like Japan, China, and New Zealand in Asia, in Viva Asiana? Or do you think, uh, how, what, what, what will it take to beat them, the top teams well, in the region? Well, the first answer is yes, completely, 100%. Uh, we've got good enough players here. Uh, we've got a really good coaching staff. Hey, Tab's done it before. Uh, whether he's the head coach or the coach behind the scenes helping everybody, uh, he, he, he knows what it takes. Um, I, played, I played 190 games for my national team. I, I played professionally since I was 16 years old. I can't tell you how many times I played in a game where the other team was 10 times better than we were on paper and we win the game by 15 or 20 points. Because playing harder matters, playing smarter matters, playing tougher matters. You can do those three things and out-hustle everybody and give everybody a really hard game. And you've got to hit shots. So, yeah, we can beat all those teams, but we've got to play harder, smarter, more together, and we've got to make shots. Thank you. Um, Doc Teddy, there's more? Yes, Coach. Uh, 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 Coach Mark? 
Yeah. Uh, we have a question here. Um, in your in your span of time here as as a coach, what uh, who were the local players who have impressed you the most? Man, there's a lot, a whole lot. Now I got to be careful because I might get in trouble for tampering. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, that'll I, be I all right. Just, just players, and obviously my talk of text players. I, I'll, I'll leave them out, right? So, so you know, like, uh, look, the player that I think that is is the hardest to guard in, in, in different ways is Stanley Pringle. Um, he's good with the ball. He's good without the ball. He's really good on defense. Big fan of his. Uh, I, look, look, man. I, I like Lasseter a lot uh, from San Miguel. I like his demeanor. I like how hard he plays. Um, but there's a lot of plays. Matt Gallo from from Blackwater. I kind of like that. how he's multi-dimensional. Um, Don's not one of my players now, but I really was a huge fan of Don. Uh, just loved how he played offensive rebounds. But there's so many. Um, you know, like like we just don't have we just don't have the bigger players here. So you have a whole lot of mid-sized players that end up being super effective uh, just by virtue of the fact that if you're 6'4", 6'5", you can play a big man role. Um, on my previous team coaching or playing anywhere, man, I was 6'2", and little, right? There'd be two seven-footers you start with, a 6'10 guy and a 6'4", 6'5", shooting guard of me. So... You know, like the game over here is a little bit different. You kind of look out there sometimes and you're like, wow, Alan Santos has 15 rebounds and he's 6'4", right? So the, the, the game here is totally different. Um, but in a good way too, you know, in, in, in a good way. There's, there, there's so many players. I, I like Elorde from, uh, from Northport. I love how he plays. Um, there's a lot of players in the PBA that have, that have, that have impressed me and maybe – not valued by other people so much, but I just like how he pressures the ball and, and on offense, he moves the ball to other players because I think at the point guard spot, that's kind of a lost art. So many people now want to score the ball, which is fine, but I, I really love the players that want to try and involve everyone else on the court. Coach, um, we have a question here from Joe and Ronnie. It's, it's almost identical. Uh, in terms of the national team, uh, in terms of the physicality, uh, and size, do we have enough? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Look, look, the game has changed. You're gonna, you know, most, most offenses are four out, one in. So you're gonna have one guy that's gonna be an issue down low, maximum. You know, the post up game now is not 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 what it used to be. Um, you know, like Boy Aram and players like that, they can definitely hold that down. They're just gonna be able to go out screen and rolls and and be able to stick to rules and defensive rebounds. So, look, we, we, we've got more than enough uh, size, big guys. Um, I, I'm sure whoever the naturalized player that that uh, that SBP decides to get will be a bigger player, and that'll be someone that can help anchor the middle. and And we've got enough at every other spot. and And keeping in mind that internationally, Jumo is really, really good. Uh, he's more than capable of of being an anchor down there, especially for 15, 20 minutes a game. Who are you eyeing, Coach? Uh, just, just uh, from. From uh, on top of your head, who are you eyeing as our next naturalized guy? Well, that, that, that's not me. You'd have to ask Tab that, or Ryan, or, or Boss Al, or any of them. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just the hired hand at this particular decision. Um, I, I'm sure whoever it is will be a proven international player and a really, really, really good player. So I don't have any names. I haven't even spoken to Tab about it. Uh, you know, kind of since, 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 the, since the virus hit, it's been more like, uh, Tad's telling me a video to watch. He's not telling me uh, planning for the future because when is the future coming, right? It's like everything's on hold. Mm -hmm. Among the PBA coaches, who have you had the hard time the most? It's from uh, Coach Dindo Patricio. Man, all of them have presented different problems. Uh, I, I felt like the first conference was pretty easy because we were taken, we were taken kind of lightly. Um, you know, being that we've been so up and down the previous conference, meaning that last year's all Filipino. Uh, look, look, all the teams are, are, are well organized. Um, there's, there's really not one coach that has presented more problems than the others. Um, off the top of my head, 
I mean, Norm, Norman Black gave us huge gave us huge issues uh, in the last semi final series. I mean, that was a a big wasted opportunity for us. I, I felt like we match up really really well with the uh, just because they're so disciplined. Some of the stuff we do on defense gives them trouble. So that was a huge wasted opportunity for us. Coach Norman seems to always coach uh, well against um, talking tanks or better against the talk of text for some reason? Well, I, look, I think it's a combination of things. I mean, you know, like we're the big brother, they're the little brother, that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like we're, we're seen in our group as being um, the favorite son, whether that's right or wrong. Uh, so, you know, it is right. Them, you know, both their man and left, you know, they, they, they come at us, I feel like harder than they come at any of the other teams in the PBA. So, you know, and that's fine. That's how it should be. But at the same time, man, their players are super motivated now, motivated for a myriad of reasons to prove that they're good enough or that they, you know, that, that, that they're trying to prove a point. Um, and they seem to play better and harder against us. So, you know, for us, that's a that, that, that's something that we've tried to address and we've talked about. But at the same time, man, like they did a good job last conference and in the playoffs, they beat us. So, you know, we've got to find a way to come back whenever the next conference is and try and do that back to them. Coach, I don't, um, you know, I don't know if you have watched that um, uh, webinar we did with Coach Trot Reyes, or you have read it on paper that he came out that uh, uh, he thinks that the the, the Gilas program uh, would be better off with the Filipino coach. What's your take on this? Well, look, um, well, first off, I did see his webinar. It was really good too, by the way. And first off, uh, huge respect for Chot. He's been really nice to me since I've been here. Obviously. You know, I love Josh, his son. He's helped me so much. Really good young coach. Um, yeah, like 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 I saw his comments. That 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 didn't strike me one way or the other. Um, you know, it's probably a good conversation to have at some point. But to me, it should be more about you know, like who 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 is the most qualified for the job. Um, surely you want to have the most qualified person for that, whoever that is. Now, if that's somebody from here or somebody from Croatia or or France or Australia or wherever then surely that person should be the best applicant for the job. I, I don't think it, it, it necessarily matters where that person is from. Um, you know, coaching all around the world now, I mean, whoever that coach is, if it's me or somebody else, I'm sure is going to be able to relate to the players and motivate the players and get them to play how they want them to play. So I don't see that as being such a big issue, but I do respect where he's coming from. Thank you, Coach. Um... Teddy? Coach, uh, we have a question here from Coach Emerito. He asks, what are the differences in player temperaments, such as ability to pick up uh, concepts, dealing with losing, mental sharpness in pressure situations, and so on, in New Zealand, as compared to the players here in the Philippines? Thank you. Well, well, New Zealand might be a, that, that, that might be a bad example, and, and let me explain to you why. Because we have a good 15 players. Under that, we have a whole lot of developing players that maybe one day could play on the national team. I, I think it, it, a, bit of, a bit of perspective is compared to somewhere like Europe. Okay, Turkey, I played five years there. So if you compare it to Turkey, they have a first, second, and third division. Uh, the teams in third division are, are good. They can compete with the teams in second and first division. Um, we're talking a depth of maybe three or 4,000 players over there that are all capable and good. Um, huge population of people, all love basketball, all know basketball, educated in basketball, understand terminology, uh, grew up in the game, uh, kind of like what has happened here. Uh, I feel like the Filipino players really intelligent and fixed concepts up. I feel like they know ball, they're really experienced. And because they've played so much, especially in the PBA, they've just played game after game after game. And the coaching for the most part is pretty good. So the players are able to be coached and, and you don't have to go over and over things. You can show things a couple of times and they, they can pick up the concept of it. Now, the, the habit part of it or how to get them to that be a habit is something that is difficult over here because maybe players get more comfortable and realize that they're kind of in a situation where uh, from the PBA, where do I go next? 
I'll just hold on to my job here in the PBA and make sure that the people behind me can't come and take my job. So maybe the competition factor is not the same here for jobs as to what it is in Turkey or Greece or Russia or other countries I played in. And I think that's a part of it. But the education and the intelligence of the player here, man, they're smart. They pick stuff up. That's not the issue. The issue is, will they do the things that you're trying to get them to do? Right? Which I'll be asking. Ali, your question, yeah. yeah. I'll be asking my, uh, my question. Um, uh, with your many years of uh, playing and, and coaching all around the world, uh, could you kindly give us five qualities that a basketball coach should possess in order to be successful? Thank you. Sure. Well, the first thing, and most importantly, is to be a teacher of the game. You know, that is the most important thing. So if you wanted to know what the most important quality of being a good coach that I've seen other coaches be really, really good at is their teacher first. So they don't want or think that the players are just going to pick up stuff or they should know it. Uh, anything they don't know, that's a teaching moment. So, you know, the better coaches I had were constantly pushing me and trying to help me and then teaching me the right way to do stuff. You know, the second thing is to be really organized, right? So you have a practice plan. You've got to have a plan for this month. You've got to have a plan for this conference. You've got to have a plan for the next conference. You've got to have a plan for the whole 12 months. You've got to have a plan for each player. In a year, he should be here. Uh, these are the things we worked on. And then another plan for the next year. You've got to constantly be organized. You've got to know the teams you're playing against, what the coach is trying to do, what the player is trying to do. You want to have a complete plan so that when you look back at that previous day, week, month, year, you're able to say, okay, we did everything we could possibly do to be organized to do well. You know, the third thing is you've got to be a really good communicator. So to be a good communicator doesn't just mean communicating directly with the player. That means communicating with the players in order to communicate with the other players in a fashion that builds team cohesiveness. That means talking to the management in a way that lets the management believe that we're going in the right direction. That means talking to the coaches in a way that you get their buy-in and you give them the opportunity to have their roles and grow. Um, you know, like uh, one thing I always remember Tad telling, uh, telling me when I was young, uh, and not young, but just growing up through the national team and with him, to our other assistant, his other assistant coaches is, you should want to be the head coach one day. You should want to have my job. And I'm trying to teach you in order how to do that. So I relate that to all the coaches all the time, that you should want to be the head coach because when you want to be the head coach and you're communicating and thinking like the head coach, that helps you grow. Um, the fourth thing, and now it becomes, you know, more in-depthly the motivating factor. How do you motivate all your players and communicate and get into their head that they have to go in the game and really get their best effort out there? You know, you can't do that. You can't motivate well if you do not have an individual relationship with everybody um, and know what makes them tick and talk to them all differently. Yes, you treat everybody in the team the same, but that doesn't mean that you approach them and communicate with them the same. Um, you've got to find a way to motivate everybody because some people aren't motivated by money. Some people are. Some people are motivated because they want, don't want to let anybody in their team down. Some people are motivated because they want to win desperately. You know, it's finding out what motivates everybody in your team and then being able to pull that, pull that button and push that each time you need to. And then the fifth part for me is how do you deal with pressure? How do you deal with the games? Uh, what do you like in the games? What is your demeanor in the games? You know, how do you handle your referee interaction? Uh, how do you handle timeouts? Uh, do you have plays up your sleeve? Do you understand and make adjustments to what the other coach is making? Um, you know, they're the five things to me that I've seen that great coaches are able to take all five of those parts, individually become really good at them, and then pull them all in, uh, together in order to be a really good and successful coach. Thanks, Coach. Coach, um, uh, Ian's asking, uh, who do you consider to be your coaching mentor? Well, look, I have three. Uh, I have three I lean on a lot. Obviously, Coach Tab, awesome. He's been there for me for a long time. Um, 
Uh, obviously, Bill Baino has been there for me since I was 18 years old. And Brian Gorshin, I lived and played with him before I went to college in the States to play with Baino. And, and of course, my father, who I lean on a lot. Um, they're the four guys that I really talk to a lot. I've got other good friends that are coaches, you know, Division One coaches in college or in Europe. But for the most part, I kind of trigger on those three or four guys. We have a question from Opong um, from Ghana. Opong's asking, what are the building blocks that have gotten Filipino basketball to where it is today? What lessons can any country draw from Philippine basketball? Thank you. Well, passion is one thing that Filipino players and, and fans and everybody loves ball over here and everybody's educated about ball. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest advantage that the Philippine has, Filipino has is that the average person understands basketball and knows how it should look. Uh, it's in your blood over here. I mean, it's your national game. Uh, anytime that that, that that takes place, it, it, the, the only thing you need to look at and, and really get under control is what is our style of play and what is the skill set of our players? If, if that starts getting right from the time the kids are 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Man, the, the basketball over here is going to take off in the next decade or two. And, and look, on that point, you know, I, I've got three young sons, um, you know, 14, just turned 15, 13, 11, and, and they've all been playing a lot of basketball over here. And it, there's one thing that I've seen around the world and I've seen in New Zealand that we didn't allow to happen is that we just didn't allow teams to play zone until they were 16 years old. Um, we made them play man to man, and no teams play zone because what has been proven and figured and worked out is that around the world people just can't shoot the ball that well when they're young and and when you when you just stand in a zone a you don't learn how to play defensive rules and principles and and b offensively it turns into everybody into standing around and stationary it's very difficult to run motion offenses against any kind of defense when they're young let alone against the zone so that's just a byproduct of something I've observed. But that would be the first thing if I had any influence that I would take out. I would make every team have to play man. Thanks, Coach. Coach Ria? That's an excellent point, uh, Coach. Uh, yeah, uh, again, Coach, would like to thank you. And hopefully, um, you know, there'll be more basketball for us this year or, or uh, coming, coming soon, hopefully. Um, just, just um, I'd like you to address, uh, of course, uh, the PBA fans and Talk Text fans. Uh, just uh, what uh, what have been uh, what what has the team been doing, or and uh, sure. some parting words from you? Sure. Well, firstly, obviously, uh, we're we're all hoping that there's PBA games to be played or basketball. Uh, it, look, it's difficult for everybody and. And I know for the players at Talk and Pets, it's been really difficult for them. And I'm sure all the other players, not only in the Philippines, but all around the world. Um, you know, we, we've tried to stay in contact with them as much as we can and make sure that they're doing their workouts and mentally staying strong. But look, you know, the whole social media and, and not being directly in front of people, it, it's difficult to know exactly what's going on. So, you know, I, I hope sooner rather than later, there's, there's a break so that at least people can get out and, and physically look at everyone in the eye again and, 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 and see how people are doing and and, and hopefully in a, in a month or two be able to get out and start practicing again and, and hopefully get ready for another conference. But look, there's bigger issues in basketball right now. There's a lot of people that are getting sick and, yeah. and, and, and not doing well. So, you know, we're, we're going to be relying on science and hoping and hoping that, uh, that they work out a way in order to make it so that we can play again. Um, you know, in the meantime, for the talking text and the PBA fans, uh, look, I'm sure every coach and every player is doing everything they can do to try and get ready and and put the best product on the floor that we can whenever the games come back. Um, from what we're understanding around the world, the, the games will return with no fans, but you know, thankfully for the PBA, all the fans uh, on, can sit at home on TV and watch the game. So. You know, to PBA fans, look, I feel like we've got a really good team. Uh, I felt like we've been building for this conference coming up. Obviously, with the addition of Poirier, and that kind of puts us 
in a position now with with him and Kelly Williams. We've got we've got two really good frontline guys that I feel like can really anchor our defense and and be unselfish on offense. So look, I was super excited for this coming conference whenever it comes. And look, if it doesn't come, whenever this next conference comes, I'm sure we'll be ready. So you know, like uh, Ariel, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to come on and talk. Um, I've really enjoyed, you know, logging in and, and, and looking and hearing what the other coaches have to say. Um, you know, A, it fills in in a couple of hours, and B, it's always interesting to hear what other coaches said, just like I was telling you before. So thank you for that. And look, I hope everybody out there is safe and well. You know, hopefully in the future we get back to playing basketball and 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 by 2023, Delis' national team is ready to roll so that then we can knock a lot of these big teams over and do really well. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Coach, and uh, for sharing. And you know, of course, uh, we only see you uh, on TV. Our fans only see you TV. Shop. This is like uh, you know a conversation, just like uh, we're just in Starbucks, and so is uh, we we got you uh, with us sharing, and you know. Because uh, most of the time, they, they, some coaches think you're a snob, but you know, Coach Billy Bayo was telling me that you know you're you're just a serious guy. Well, yeah, man. Well, well, look, look, it's very difficult. The rules are set up over here to be for me to uh, for it to be difficult. I, I, I don't, I don't really, you know, it's not my personality to come off like that. You know, I'm just trying to find the, follow the rules that the PBA set as per a consultant, right? So, so look, look. Hopefully, over time. I'm able to get out there and uh, and be seen a little bit more in more of a relaxed city. Cool, cool, coach. And you know, uh, Bill's been, uh, you know, um, uh, all you have the uh, great words uh, for you as a person and as a coach. And uh, hopefully, uh, we um, we'll be able to see more of you. And uh, hopefully, you bring uh, success not only to Talk of Text but also to our national national team. Now, Thank I you so much, think- coach. Yeah, thank Thanks you, so and uh, Dr. thank you, and uh, to our uh, to our attendees, uh, we have another session at uh, 8 p.m. with uh, Coach Jeffrey Cariasso. His uh, journey from being a player to a coach to a assistant coach, and now to a head coach again uh, with uh, Alaska. He's gone full jerk. Ger- full circle with uh, the Alaska Aces. So it's an interesting uh, conversation again with Coach uh, Jeffrey Garriasso. Again, Coach Mark, thank you so much. Uh, God bless. And everyone, stay safe, a quick dinner, and see you again at at, uh, 8 p.m. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks.